before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. So if racism has a relationship to empire, and if our museums have a relationship to empire, then in our museums, if we want to be anti-racist institutions, we need a new reckoning with empire. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. The saga of the Benin Bronzes is one of the bloodier, more shameful chapters in the history of the Western world's encyclopedic museums. Looted from the Kingdom of Benin in 1897 by the British in a punitive raid whose indiscriminate slaughter and wanton cruelty inspired the Hague Convention two years later, the artworks are today scattered across art institutions and ethnographic museums in Europe and the United States, a stain on the Western conscience that is insanguinated with the sins of colonialism. Recently, the Oxford professor and Pitt Rivers Museum curator, Dan Hicks, wrote a book about this history called The Brutish Museums, The Benin Bronze's Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution. Last week, we spoke to him on the podcast about the horrific events that led to the artworks leaving Africa. This week, I'm pleased to present part two of the conversation, where we talk about the urgency of writing this colonial crime and the status of the Benin Bronze's restitution today. Could you go into the story of when the calls for restitution began and how they started to kind of grow and gather force over time? Yes, of course. So in the case of the Benin Bronzes and indeed for the return of other African cultural heritage, this is a long-term struggle. It was in the mid-1930s when the Obers, obviously after the formation of modern Nigeria, the royal court was re-established under the British and it was when Obu Akenzawa II, he came to the throne in the 1930s, that he began to demand the return of the sacred and royal objects. And as early as 1938, the first such returns were made. There were two crowns and a coral work garment that were returned under the British. And movement there that Obu Akenzawa II started has been a demand that has been repeated under the British, and indeed the British Museum, as the book says, even sold a series of objects at sort of cut-price tokenistic sums to the national museums as they were being established in the 1950s and 60s. Further demands were made in the 1970s. Then, of course, there was a lot of intensification around the 100-year anniversary in 1997 as well. More recently, we've seen a real rekindling of those claims I think now, though, importantly, across the continent of Africa. So, you know, we're at a point where there is significant cooperation in between West African nations. You know, according to the new head of the African Union in 2021 to two, there are two priorities for the African Union. And the first is COVID. And the second is the return of objects that were taken under colonialism. You know, I think where it's a very interesting moment and maybe lockdown... And, you know, the changes we're seeing, the crisis we're seeing now in sort of destination tourism, you know, adds another layer to that. But, you know, what does that mean for the hyper concentration of culture in the global north? How come all all of the universal museums are in the north? And when these objects are of such importance, you know, in Nigeria to inspire art, identity, but also fashion, you know, music, literature. Then, of course, the importance of of a sense of heritage, the importance for the royal court of these objects as sovereign objects. For all those reasons, I think we're at a very, very interesting moment where those arguments of the 1930s have a new resonance. So you mention how over the last century and a quarter, a lot of artworks have gone back to museums in Nigeria to the extent that today the third largest concentration of Benin objects that were taken in this raid are now in museums across Nigeria. This fact remains that the vast majority of these objects are still outside of the country. And this goes back to the Hague Convention of 1899 because the complexity comes in 
that these objects, you could argue, were not taken illegally. And so therefore, the museums don't have to give it back. And this opens the door to all kinds of seductive rationalizations. But at the same time, I just wonder, how do museum directors manage to argue against what is such a clear moral case for returning these objects? We hear all sorts of arguments, which now sound incredibly hollow, I, I have to say, whereas maybe they were more convincing a generation ago. So we hear the argument that if you were to return objects, they might not be on public display. They might be sold. They might be in some danger from Islamic terrorism and they might be unsafe. But of course, what's happened in the intervening years since we were debating these things in the 80s or 90s is that restitution has become a normal part of how all our museums operate in the case of Holocaust spoliation and in the case of the return of ancestral remains. So in North America, under what's known as uh, NAGPRA, First Nations are routinely able to say our ancestral remains should be returned. And in the case of Holocaust spoliation, most art museums now have a provenance researcher who, crucially under the Washington Principles of 1998, moved the onus of responsibility of knowing what had been looted from the claimant to the institution those researchers are actively, they're proactively understanding the history of the collections. So, of course, we aspire to having museums where nothing was looted. You know, the taking of objects from Africa is an entirely different history. It's a very different question. But that doesn't mean that we don't already have all the processes. And so many of the arguments we hear now about African objects were put in those other examples. We were told, how will you know that you return the human remains you know, to the right claimant? We were told if you return a painting to a family, you know, what if they don't display it? Well, you know, what if it's in a private home? Well, Absolutely. It's their object. They can do what they want with it. And we're getting to this point where actually, I mean, why are we treating Africans any differently to the way in which we importantly have seen these advances for Maori groups, for First Nations in North America and in these other cases? You know, you'll hear from the Met that they, and indeed from some other North American institutions, that they bought these bronzes you know, fair and square at Sotheby's or Christie's. But there's no question in my mind that the immediate response has got to be, well, how many times, you know, after a theft does an object have to pass hands in between Europeans and Americans for it sort of no longer to be a looted object? Five times or 10 times? If you move it between people 15 times, does that somehow mean it's no longer stolen? That's really where the wheels are starting to come off these arguments. Yeah, you know, the book goes into some of the parallels with the war in Iraq in 2003. The Blair and the Bush administrations then, in a very different context, talked about the coalition of the willing. There's a coalition of the willing in a very, very different way happening in museums right now, where there's a new generation of curators, of directors. There's a groundswell among museum workers who see this as you know, a very simple issue. You know, when objects are demanded you know, to be returned, then we take that seriously. So we'll hear the old arguments that this is an attack upon museums, this is going to lead to empty galleries, people who talk about restitution want to send everything back. And of course, that's why my intervention as a curator is so important here. So I you know, care about my institution. You know, I think we've never needed something like a World Culture Museum, you know, more than we do today, where we can look at art outside of the conventional Eurocentric lens. But that doesn't mean on a case by case basis, when objects are demanded to be returned, that we shouldn't allow that conversation to happen and allow action to lead from those conversations where appropriate. Just to point out the extreme hypocrisy of the situation Going back to some of the things that the museum directors say as excuses in terms of not returning it, they say that it'll be kept safer in European museums while we know that thousands of objects were actually destroyed during the Blitz in the Liverpool Museum when <laughs> they were hit by a Nazi bomb. They say that they will be displayed to masses of world travelers 
And as you write in the book, a lot of these objects are actually in tiny little regional museums that don't have the wherewithal to show them to anybody. And then you also point out that there is what you call the, quote, the sheer haphazard nature of the supposed Western curation of universal heritage is shocking. And so on the other side of this, what is happening in Nigeria today in terms of creating a counter argument? So for many people in this conversation, one of the interesting potentials is actually restitution takes the form of you know signing a piece of paper that this is a transfer of ownership. There's an ongoing uh, Nigerian question, of course, about you know whether all objects you know go to the royal court, you know the role of the state and the role of the federal government. But that's a Nigerian question, you know, and it's important that Europeans really do not seek to influence that. You know, in this case, I mean, there is a new museum that's being built, and Sir David Adjay has been appointed as, as architect, and there is now the new uh, Legacy Restoration Trust which is an entity which is Nigerian-based that brings together each of the key players. There's a lot of involvement from the governor of Edo State, who was re-elected for another four years in October last year. You know, this is at the top of his priority. There's a lot that's going on in Nigeria to renew these claims. We just heard you know, the other week that the German ambassador to Berlin repeated the claims. But, you know, for people like me, and others in the American and the European museums, we have to ask how many times have each of the Nigerian actors actually got to ask for returns in order for us to start the process of sort of moving away from simply dialogue, you know, into action. So many of the museums we're talking about have been shut down over the years and the objects have been sold off. But equally, let's talk about what's also not on display. So many of these things we're talking about for African restitution are not even on the database of our museums in Britain. And so the British Museum tells us it has approximately 900 objects that were taken in 1897. That's not a firm figure. You know, we don't even know what the full number is. And of those, 800 are not on display. If you roll that out across the country in the UK, I'd estimate that under 1% and maybe under 0.1% of the objects that were taken from Africa under colonialism, which are now in our museums in Britain, and that's not only the national museums, it's the university museums, the vast majority is in boxes that haven't been opened for 100 years in some cases. You know, This is the reality of what we're talking about. We have underinvested in the infrastructure. We don't know about the conservation you know, fates of these things, we, we don't even know exactly what's there. So that's how bad things are in terms of this argument that they're safer off, you know, in the West. How can they be safe if we don't know, even for objects as important and as well known as the Benin bronzes? And then you start thinking about Asante gold, or you start thinking about objects that were taken from Sudan or from Kenya or from South Africa, and you're into a whole other question. So there's a lot of work to do for us if anyone's going to hold on to this idea that sort of Western museums have any, you know, any role to play in anything other than just actually, you know, giving back whenever asked. But it seems that there is actually an optimistic turning of the tide Emmanuel Macron has really blazed a trail in some positive directions here. Can you describe what are the positive signs and signals that we're seeing come out of European museums when it comes to restitution? Yeah, so I think we're at a really critical moment and we have to get this right because, you know, there's a generational change that's happening. It's it's something akin, actually, to what the book describes as you know, what happened at the Pitt Rivers, which was very much a South African-led movement. So the Roads Must Fall Oxford movement, as it emerged in Oxford in 2015, had started at the University of Cape Town. And this was 2015. So this was, you know, after apartheid ended in 1994, there was a grassroots student uh, campaign in 2015 among students that had been born after the end of apartheid that continued to experience racism. And at the heart of their campaign was the removal of the ongoing, enduring colonial propaganda, kind of naturalised and normalised you know, white supremacy in relation to empire, that at the heart of which, of course, was the image of Rhodes 
at the centre of the campus. And suddenly in Oxford, the conversation wasn't only about Cecil Rhodes, because there's an image of him on the front of Oriel College, Oxford. It was also about other colonial endurances that had been sort of built in the 1880s, 1890s, early part of the 20th century. And so the Pitt Rivers was in their sights, absolutely rightly, from the word go. And there was a certain moment on social media, as the book says, where the tweet was sent that said the Pitt Rivers Museum is one of the most violent spaces in Oxford. And I hadn't seen the museum that way before. It was the beginning in many ways of the work that went into this book was to try and understand what that meant, because you should be open to the idea that something should change. I think there's a similar generational shift that's happening within Europe now. It isn't about the end of apartheid, but it is, I think, about the way in which empire is over and yet not over. So in Germany, with the conversations there around Humboldt Forum, in the Netherlands, where there's been an announcement that they wish to return objects that were taken under empire, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that is being established in Belgium in relation to empire and the Belgian Congo, the removal of imperialist statues from the Welsh Assembly, the uh, so even the devolved regions in the UK are interested in this in these topics, and there's a crossover in between the African-led movements of fallism, the removal of statues, which of course we saw also reproduced in North America around the images of the Confederacy. There's a joining up of those arguments with the African-led movement for restitution. So fallism and restitution have this thing in common as African-led movements that date back right into the 20th century. They haven't just arrived out of nowhere. And they are about the removal of the white infrastructure, whereby a really short period of time, actually, between, say, the 1880s and the 1920s, art and culture was really co-opted and put to work by those who wished to memorialise and to naturalise, even to justify, certainly to make endure anti-black violence. So that's the moment we now find ourselves in. Historians will look back on why these changes are happening socially now, but it seems that this is a global shift It's about the different economic relationships between Africa and uh, Europe and America. It's also the moral case, really. We might seek to tie ourselves up in legal arguments that we have some right to these objects and we got them fair and square. But in a time at which our institutions are seeking to be anti-racist and at times at which it's increasingly understood by academic work, that racism has a history. It doesn't come from nowhere. It's not a human universal in any simple way. It has a relationship, as we know from America, with the history of enslavement. But in Europe, it also has a relationship to empire. So if racism has a relationship to empire, and if our museums have a relationship to empire, then in our museums, if we want to be anti-racist institutions, we need a new reckoning with empire. When something fails, you see it. If you're on your way to work and your car won't start, you know, that car is seen in a way that it wasn't on any normal morning, you know, that you were going into work. You suddenly see it. Something similar has happened to the Colonial Museum. It's failed and we're seeing it. And we are going to have to open up the, you know, the bonnet and and to fix the engine. And that might involve having to replace some parts. In this case, of course, the replacement of those parts surely involves the physical dismantling of white infrastructure where it exists. These kind of cancerous elements at the eating away at the heart of the museum that are holding us back from being fit for the 21st century. Let's take a moment to just go from theory to practice, because it just so happens that one of the largest concentration of looted Nigerian objects in the world is actually at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, where you have 10 of the uh, bed and bronzes, plaques, and dozens of other looted objects. And so as, as a curator at this museum, what do you intend to do? to make this right? You know, I think there are two tasks for curators in my position. So the tasks for me are to use the privilege. Uh, you know, I have a whole load of privileges in this conversation, you know, maleness and whiteness and being associated to a very wealthy institution. 
But maybe the biggest privilege in this specific conversation is access to knowledge. I had the esoteric knowledge that was necessary to write this book and to share knowledge of which institutions, you know, the provisional list of where these objects are in the world and to try and tell the story and why this matters and to share that knowledge. And I think that's the first task. You know, if we return the Ben in bronzes, we're not going to solve the problem of African restitution. There are many other examples of archaeological excavations, of indeed natural history collections. There's a big argument in Berlin about the dinosaur at the heart of the Natural History Museum that is not just an index of evolution you know, millions of years ago. It's also an artifact of unfree labour in the mining industry in East Africa under the Germans. So there's natural history objects, there's archaeological objects, there's ethnographic collecting, there's the whole question that the Macron report, the Sars Savoir report, introduced about consent. Even if something's purchased, even if it's given, there are things that can never be given because they're inalienable, they're too sacred, they're too important. So there's a lot of work to do there, but that's our job. And the second part of it is to listen to and to amplify and to respond to in an action-oriented way when objects are asked for return. Now, you know, the sharing of knowledge and the listening to and acting on the demands for return are interrelated. So the more information we share and create from the archives, you know, that have been so neglected, the more demands, I'm sure, can be made. So at the heart of this is it has to be demand-led. This is about listening to what is asked for, supporting those demands, making it easy to ask and having processes. And so the University of Oxford has adopted over the summer last year, it adopted a formal process. You can find it on our website. It's a procedure for responding to claims for the return of cultural objects and having a clear procedure and making sure there aren't too many obstacles and not having criteria that mean that you're going to say you're going to lend things rather than return them, or that you're going to add a whole load of conditions. I mean, this for me is about the unconditional and permanent return. I wish it were in my gift to say the Pitt Rivers is going to do this. This is a decision of the, uh, the trustee body. But a big part of my intervention, which I hope will be really you know, acted upon internationally in a whole set of different ways in each of these 160 and more institutions is that all these objects are not in the British Museum. 8% of them are in the British Museum. The rest are in 160 and more institutions. You know, so many of those are not national institutions. This is not simply about the formerly colonised uh, nation in a dialogue with the formerly colonial uh, nation. There are so many non-state actors here and that includes, of course, the Royal Court or the federal government. But it also includes the Pitt Rivers Museum. It includes a whole host of art museums across the USA, from uh, Detroit to Brooklyn. More than 38 institutions, in fact, across the United States alone have got these objects. So in each of those locations, a different conversation can happen. There's a different sort of a decision-making process. But I'd, I'd urge all those that listen to this, you know, to consider how far are you right now from a looted men in bronze? And how many of your favourite museums have objects that were taken from Africa which are subject to claims for return? And you know, what can you do to help those institutions come to what's increasingly a consensus where we don't have to wait for the Met and the British Museum, who have dug themselves in so much on this question or else are trying to say that they'll loan things back or whatever. I think the change is coming from other institutions, from the university institutions. And remember how many Ivy League institutions have got also got the Ben and Bronzes, you know, in, in their care. We need democratic solutions, which are about the role of audiences and stakeholders in institutions which are saying that they want to be anti-racist, they're saying that they want to be equitable, and yet have not to date said in any clear way that they wish to see returns. I think we're going to see some changes, you know, in the coming years. And the book talks about a decade of returns. You know, none of this happens overnight. It's crucial to foreground the Nigerian agency. It's absolutely crucial to ensure that you get it right. 
But that doesn't mean that the dialogue has to last forever. I was in a conversation over Zoom with a South African colleague last week who said to me that colonialism used to be that someone told you you were inferior. And today, colonialism is that someone tells you that you're in a dialogue. And that's the risk with the dialogical sort of processes around restitution in relation to the Benin Bronzes and others, is that these become talking shops and the issue is kicked uh, down the lane and that we don't see change. I'm incredibly optimistic, though, you know, that we're seeing change happen. So I have to ask, how many calls for restitution of objects from the Pitt Rivers Museum have you actually received? Well, there are ongoing claims from outside of Africa. We have some some on the continent of Africa. We hold many objects from situations where claims have been made against other institutions. And there's a kind of etiquette here about how many times someone has to ask. We have never received a formal letter asking for the return of the Benin Bronzes, as far as I know. But that doesn't mean, and I'm sure, the vast majority of the 160 institutions we're talking about also haven't. Exactly the same as we do for your know, human remains. And the Pitt Rivers, as I say, has returned your know, human remains in the case of sort of Maori objects and, and ancestors, in the case of sort of cultural objects and ancestral remains to a number of First Nations in North Africa and Canada. Somehow, Africa has been overlooked. For me... This is partly also about, you know, what these institutions are for. So here we have, I mean, I'm sitting here in the Pitt Rivers. I'm I'm in my office, which is in a, in a new extension, but I'm less than 30 yards away from the case with the Benin Bronzes in them, from the historic uh, gallery space, within which there are human remains from across what used to be the empire. The physical bodies of the uh, black and brown people who died in some interaction or other with empire and a whole host of objects, some of which have these histories as well. So as we dismantle on a case-by-case basis some of those displays, something else opens up here, which is the role of the museum as a sort of site of conscience, as a space in part for the memory of empire. It's as much a battlefield as any other site from war that was where we remember, you know, the past and where we seek to heal and to find some degree of reconciliation in the present and some hope. And we can learn from all sorts of other sorts of institutions where heritage and museums have had a role in healing societies. Certainly in the case of the Benin Bronzes, it has to involve the physical dismantling of these displays, in my view. Hmm. Well, after reading your book and having this fascinating conversation, I hope that somebody in Nigeria listens and takes you up on the offer and maybe writes you a letter. Yeah, that's right. I don't think we're waiting for a letter to be written from Nigeria, actually, at all. I think what I'm hoping is I'm hoping the trustee body will consider, along with others, some, you know, proactive, you know, offer, seeing as there is no doubt that the demand is already there. You know, I don't think it's right to insist there's 160 letters are written to 160 institutions. I think that we can get... So, and I think we have the infrastructure with the Benin Dialogue Group, with the new Legacy Restoration Trust, with the new museum. There's enough infrastructure on the Nigerian side here to do some, something different. We just need to step up at the appropriate point. Well, thank you very much, Dan. This has been, this has been wonderful. I think this is going to be a topic that we're going to be covering for a long time. Okay. Thank you so much, Andrew. Really great to talk to you. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sodia Malili, Tim Schneider, and Caroline Goldstein. Thanks for listening, and see you next week.